What I want to do first is to introduce you to some of the science underpinning climate change, because a lot of what we base this course on implicitly is the argument that there's something quite urgent that we need to address and be aware of, namely humanity's impact on the environment. And for me, certainly, I, I, I see one of the key goals of environmental sociology as trying to better understand that relationship between forms of social organization and environmental impacts. But we can't really start to untangle that until we are fairly sure about the nature of the evidence underpinning this claim. Now, the reason I start, I'd like to start with this is, well, there's several reasons, really. One is that we spend quite a lot of time later in the course, and we will spend a little bit of time uh, today as well, talking about why some, um, why some contention has arisen around these reports in recent years. Um, namely when we talk about this we talk we're talking about the phenomenon of um, climate denialism but i also hint at the course about a general sort of trend of anti-scientism that has been running through popular discourse uh, certainly for the last decade but very very strongly so in the last three or so years and certainly there's been no shortage of conspiratorial discourse around COVID 19. so part of understanding our capacity as a as, as a society to change to address uh, the threat of climate change is uh, the public willingness to do so. And again, some of that at least is contingent on the public acceptance of um, of scientific evidence. It's also good to start off with our with a baseline understanding of what some of the key outcomes and impacts of this might be, because again, a lot of what social scientists contribute to the environmental debate is not just about how information is received, consumed and processed and so on by the public and through the media and politics and that, but it's also about planning for change and adaptation. And in later parts of the course, we'll be talking a lot about some of the frameworks that social scientists use to think about social change and the capacities that we have as a society to change in a more eco-positive or eco-friendly uh, direction. Again, we'll be more specific about that in recent week in subsequent weeks. But for now, I just want to start by introducing you to some of the some of the climate science. And certainly one of the go to sources of this is the um, Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. <clears throat> And the most recently available report from this is from um, what's called AR5, which is um, assessment round five. So the IPCC, uh, as is constituted now, is currently uh, in its sixth round, and they are expected to produce a report, their sixth, um, their sixth assessment report around September, September 2022, so September of this year. Uh, they produced them. There, there, are, there are quite wide intervals between these various reports um, because they're very complex things to produce. Uh, it involves coordination between thousands of scientists, agencies. Uh, the reports themselves are divided into uh, responsibilities are divided across what they call working groups. So what you're seeing here is part of the synthesis report, which tries to bring together all of this evidence and um, distill it in a very intuitive and understandable way. <clears throat> so this is one of the one of the go to the most standards of evidence for this with respect to climate change, because first of all, it's collaborative. It involves so many different individuals, organizations um, contributing, uh, contributing their their original research together. Um, but it also means that it involves recruiting a much broader and more global perspective on what's going on. Again, it's a synthesis of evidence from across from across the world. So there in many respects, we can sort of treat this as a representative global overview of the state of things today. We can also, as you'll see here from some of the graphs, it tells us a little bit of the history of how we got to this point. And later on, it will allow us to make some predictions about where we might be going in the future if we stay on the course that we're at now as a society in terms of our production and consumption and where we might or could possibly end up if we take if we take action now. So the IPCC report in 2014 concluded that um, of the observed period in their time series, the period 1983 to 2012 was likely the warmest 30 year period of the last 1400 years. So again, this goes back to the very important concept of climate variability. Variability from year to year, again, is remarkable, might be statistically significant, but this kind of variability on a 30 year period um, is considered something exceptional. Overall, this leads to the, this led them to conclude that there was a net warming of about 0.85 degrees over this particular period as well. Now, if you put this in historical context, this is a rate of change, and again, the rate, the rate is important as as much as the um as, as much as the quantity. Again, rate being simply quantity over time, but the rate of this and the pace of this change is quite remarkable. Um, if we put this over the time scale of uh, decades to millennia, what we have observed is warming atmosphere. 
and ocean snow and ice diminished and rising sea levels. So these are some of the key indicators that they take in the report. So how do we know that things are changing? We don't just look at the temperature. We look at we look at these other these other factors as well. Now I'll direct your attention to these two graphs here. And again, it's worth taking our time with these. We'll spend a little bit of time whenever we encounter a graph like this. It's always good to break it down into its components. So we have here on our horizontal axis, we've got time. So this is starting in 1850, running all the way up to 2012. On the vertical axis, the y axis, we have degrees. And this is change, as you can see here. This is, so we've got negative and we've got positive. So where we have negatives, we have declining. And where we have positives, we have growth. So this is globally averaged combined land and ocean surface temperature. And if we look at this over the period, we start here sort of from the was the tail end of the Industrial Revolution to the present day. We see here that we have overwhelmingly a direction of increase, but especially so if we take it from about the 1970s, 1980s up to the present day. So in terms of what they describe as unprecedented, really looking in particular at this period here from the late 60s, 70s, 80s, where this rate of change starts to become quite profound, quite profound indeed. What are the sources of this though? And again, this is something we'll spend a lot of time in the course on. And certainly in the early, in the early weeks of this course, we want to think about, um, and going back to, I suppose, classical sociology uh, that you would have studied last semester when you did classical social theory, a lot of that was really an attempt to make sense of the rapid changes that these people were observing around them in terms of the transition. If you take a, if you take, say, Marx trying to make sense of the transition from uh, from agriculture or from agrarian society um, into capitalistic wage labor, industrialized wage labor and so on. And again, the forms of social organization that went along with that. Um, Durkheim talks a lot about these different forms of solidarity that are engendered by different forms of social organization. So in classical theory, you heard an awful lot about the results of, sort of atomized individualism. What happens when people move from countries into cities where the ties that connect them to each other are weaker, where there is a more specialized division of labor, where we don't know who's making the products that we consume and so on. So there's a distance. And all of these things in classical theory are really an attempt to deal with this period of rapid change, um, an unprecedented period of change in terms of the scale of human social history. And if we look at what's going on here in terms of emissions as well, we see that a lot of this corresponds to this sort of the, this takeoff period here, certainly in, from the 1900s to the 50s, but then from the 50s to the present day is quite is quite profound. So the color coding here is showing us um, this is the source for, sorry, first of all, sources of global anthropogenic CO2 emissions. Again, on the horizontal scale, we've got time and on the vertical, we have uh, where is it? tons of CO2 uh, per year. So what this graph is doing is it's breaking it down into components. We have forestry here in this code, and we've got fossil fuels, cement, and flaring in this code. And really the, the pace of change here, again, if we overlay it with these globally average temperature anomaly deviations, we've got a period of really rapid change here from the 50s all the way up to the present day. If we look at this cumulatively, so if we just take it sort of averaged over the period 1970, sorry, 1750 to 1970, and then 1750 to 2011, even just by including those latter couple of years, we're accounting for a considerable amount of excess emissions just by adding in that additional period here from the 1970s to the 2011s. So it's telling us that there is indeed something profoundly different about what has happened to global society over this period since pretty much since the end of the since the end of the Second World War to the present. The report also shows us what the relative contributions to temperature change are over this period. So here we have a graph that's showing us, again, if we read this sort of vertically from top to bottom, we've got each of these different categories here and we've got their contribution to changes in temperature. So we have greenhouse gases up here on this diagram and we've got an estimate of their contribution. And then we have anthropogenic forcing. So when they use the term anthropogenic, they're usually talking about, they are talking about, sorry, human generated. So what does that include? So it's telling us that first of all, as we saw from the previous graph, that the period 83 to 12 was likely um, one of the most highest or the highest uh, in terms of anthropogenically, anthropogenically attributed emissions um, since the pre-industrial era. It's not hard to visualize why that is, because again, industrial production on the scale that we're familiar with today traces its origins to the 18th and 19th century. So it's no surprise that over that period it would be anthropogenic forcings at least would be uh, sources sorry would be would be strongest 
as we move into the later 19th century, 20th century, we're starting to see a massive contribution from fossil fuel combustion. And that goes into, that takes many sources. That's not just industrial production, that's electrification, the generation of electrical power, uh, the transition to automobility. So, and again, we see the effects of this on our landscape and infrastructure from today. We are a very car dependent society. Public transport in Ireland, at least, is very much residual. So we have all of these different social changes combining over that period to generate a considerable and profound impact in terms of emissions over that. Again, very short in terms of um, in terms of historical time, a very, very short period. And in the report, they identify some core factors. So what are the key factors in this? Population is obviously one. We also have over this period population growth. But again, as we'll suggest over the coming weeks, it's not really helpful to pin the blame on just on population alone. Um, the implications of that at various points in human history have been have been quite sinister. Um, we'll look at this in uh, in the second week and the third week when we look at some classical theoretical perspectives on nature and environment that said, again, not with respect to environment necessarily, but ideas that traced humanity's ills and woes to overpopulation. Uh, and again, the implications that came from this, uh, from these movements of the late 19th and early 20th centuries was that population should be restricted, that reproduction should be restricted in some way, and usually uh, usually amongst the poor, according to these according to these perspectives. Other sources include things like economic activity. Um, we can produce things using different means of production, but our economic activity at the moment tends to be emissions intensive. Uh, we rely very much on manufactured products. We rely on logistics, that's transportation networks to bring those products to us. All of these things are carbon intensive. Our lifestyles, we have become accustomed to buying things and to using things. The devices that we use have a relatively short life cycle, the clothes that we wear. Um, if we talk about a modern phenomenon like fast fashion, for example, we wear things for a relatively short period compared to how long we would have worn them, let's say 50 or 60 years ago. And the turnover on those things is quite, is quite strong. And also due to the fact that costs of production have um, been driven down in low wage economies where these clothes are produced, we are now able to uh, secure these to buy them online, have them shipped for a very, very, uh, for a very, very small charge to us, but a very, very high impact to the environment. We are also dependent on energy. We rely on it for our consumer technologies to power and heat and light our homes for our vehicles and so on. And also land use patterns have changed as well. Um, we have developed tastes and demands for certain types of products. Um, in our foods, we use a lot of palm oil. We consume a lot of coffee and these things have impacts because some of them depending on what the product is they can be intensive in terms of water in terms of labor human labor and so on so they all have impacts in different ways <clears throat> and finally one of the most obvious ones that we'll spend a bit of time on in the course is climate policy there are mitigation measures adapt adaptation measures that we can take uh, that we haven't taken and those are policy decisions so it is to some extent within the gift of us as a society and the people that represent us to do something about this uh, why has nothing been done or why has so little been done to understand that we need to understand the machinations of climate policy, which we will try to do. The one thing the IPCC tries to do as well is to give us a sense of where we might be going with this. Again, don't get too hung up on the figures in the diagram. We just want to look at the direction of travel here. So I'm going to point towards three of these. It's called RCP 2.6, which is color coded here. 4.4 to 6.0, which are these two these two here, and then RPC 8.5, which is this one here. So this is observed emissions. Up to, the, up, up to the production of the report, this is cumulative emissions as observed in a time series up to the present day, which at this point, the last data point, I think, in AR5 was, uh, was 2012, 2010, 2012. These are predictions. So these lines are showing us predictions of where we're going in terms of annual emissions if we adopt a stringent approach to emissions, so if we really, really restrict emissions, we might end up on RCP 2.6. RCP stands for a representative concentration pathway. If we do very little or we do, you know, sort of we land somewhere in the mid range, if, if we only reduce a little bit, we're on the intermediate pathway represented by these two. And if we do nothing, if we can, if, if we allow emissions to continue as they are and even to grow, we end up on RCP 8.5, which is this one here. So if we do nothing, we're, this is where we're headed, pretty much. If we do what the, again, what a variety of climate scientists, social scientists would suggest and adopt a very stringent approach, which again would involve some variant of 
degrowth, either reducing our economic growth or switching to a regime of negative economic growth, where we're not growing our economies, but we're shrinking our production. Again, not to the extent that we'll compromise, you know, human flourishing and human safety, because we already overproduce. Um, degrowth is about reducing our economic output and throughput to a point that's uh, minimum enough to satisfy human needs, but also satisfies this this goal of achieving a net reduction in emissions. So if we um, if we adopt a very stringent approach to this, uh, we might end up here on 2.6, where we could potentially level off. So this is a very pessimistic scenario, given that we're currently somewhere between 6.0 and 8.5. So it's an illustration of the need for and the urgency of imminent action. Similarly, they give predictions for global average surface temperature. If we look at 2.6 versus 8.5, so this is the, the do nothing scenario. This is the stringent scenario. We intervene immediately. We drastically bring down our emissions. Similarly, in terms of the impact of sea level, this is change in millimeters. This is change in degrees. So we're looking at, again, we're looking at the, the secular trend here, irrespective of which pathway we're on, is, is growth. But we can slow that growth rate if we adopt this pathway. If we, stay, if we keep going as we are, very high emissions, we're ending up somewhere here with about 0.6 um, to 0.7 millimeters of growth by the end of the century. You can see here that the scenario, the, the distance between this scenario is approximately two and a half degrees. So that's quite a considerable estimated difference over the course of this century. If we compare the do nothing compared to the do everything scenario. And it also shows us where some of the key changes might be. And this brings us on to a very important aspect of the course, which is about inequality. We know that climate change is, is and is going to be a globally unequal unequal process. There are some societies that will adapt um, quite well and there are some societies that will be impacted severely by this. We're already starting to see some of the impacts of this um, with respect to things like the, the Californian fires, the wildfires, um, the Australian fires of last year. And again, phenomena like this that previously would have been, say, decennial events are now occurring on a much more uh, on a much more frequent time scale. So the impacts of climate change include things like an increased incidence or probability of severe weather events um, and so on. So this is giving us a sense of the global inequalities in this, where the change in average surface temperature is going to be. And again, on the left, we've got the, you know, we make a serious effort to reduce emissions and the one on the right is showing what might happen if we don't do anything. Similarly with precipitation, you can see here the, the increase is concentrated in bands and in certain regions. And you can see here similarly as well with changes in temperature also. We know that the impact in terms of extreme events um, is going to be also globally unequal. So this diagram, I'll leave this with you and we might, we'll come back to this in class uh, time and again anyway, but what this is showing you basically is that we've got the icons correspond to impacts in terms of physical systems. So this is glacier, snow, ice and our permafrost melting, where you see the drop we're having impacts on rivers, lakes. So these are physical systems, biological systems. If you see this icon in the region, there's going to be an impact in terms of wildfires, um, reduction in terrestrial ecosystems, marine ecosystems. And then we have two categories for human and managed systems, food production, so agriculture, and then livelihoods, health and economics. So the impacts of climate change on human physical health um, in terms of extreme heat and so on, things like that. And also there are the, the, the impacts on our food production. Along with each of these comes an assessment based on the evidence in the report of their confidence that these are attributable to climate change. So again, there are several reasons why we might expect in Europe an impact on marine ecosystems that might not necessarily be linked to climate change. But given the indicated degree of confidence here, they're suggesting that they are very, very highly confident that the impact on marine ecosystems in Europe is attributable to climate change. In North America, we have a high confidence in things like uh, an increased incidence of wildfires, impacts on food production systems. And again, if we look here um, in Africa, especially, we've got quite severe impacts in terms of livelihood, in terms of food production, um, and also quite severe impacts in terms of terrestrial ecosystem, biodiversity, marine ecosystems and that. So if you get a sense from this graph how uneven and how unequally distributed some of these impacts are likely to be, and that's something we'll look at in subsequent weeks, which is that as the probability of these extreme events and the impacts on these various subsystems increases, these are not going to be felt equally across the globe and also different societies now have different capacities to respond to this. If we can compare, for example, the global north versus south, if we think in terms of the resources, and again, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a really terrifying reminder of this. If we look at 
uh, the distribution of vaccines in uh, in Africa, for example, versus the rollout of vaccines in Europe, North America, um, parts of the Middle East, places like Israel and that. Uh, very considerable differences in uptake and rate and availability between the global north and the global south. So one thing that we do know from climate change is that this is only going to, the impacts are only going to be exacerbated by existing inequalities. We live in an unequal world and those inequalities will be amplified by the consequences of climate change. A good way to visualize some of these inequalities is by looking at, this is what's called a cartogram. So a cartogram takes a variable. In this case, the variable is the percentage of uh, individuals in a given society that have no water access and what it does is it reshapes the region so you can see here if we just take the United States right very few comparatively fewer uh, people in the United States do not have access to water so if we think of the percentage here is somewhere around sub one percent then um, the United States gets a very very small again it's shrunk down by the cartogram algorithm into this very very small space so the largest areas are exaggerated and we get to see where the where the impacts are going to be. So we've got India, Sub-Saharan Africa, very little impact here in the global north. No impact in North America, United States, Canada, some impact in South America and some very little impact again here in the north. Really, the impact is concentrated over here in the global south. We see a similar process replicated here if we look at the percentage of um, preventable neonatal deaths again using 2015 data impacts very much concentrated again in the global south and prior to COVID at least and that's not really helpful to update this because we have um, figures here which are uh, which which include the most recent uh, pandemic COVID-19 so this is obviously up to 2019 non-COVID related deaths again the burden of disease mortality is concentrated here in Africa the global south uh, and in these countries just off the Caribbean here as well so the bottom line is that we are facing into a scenario where we have a reasonably high degree of confidence in the attributability of these changes that we're seeing in terms of weather systems and extreme weather events to climate change. But when we layer this on top of a system of existing global inequalities, we're looking at a very, very severe impact indeed. So in the next section, um, we'll develop some of these points a little bit further.